with us today. Our services are every Sunday here at uh, Barrancoa Chapel at 9.30 Sunday mornings. Uh, if I may be a help, feel free to call or text me at 361-404-0397. That's 361-404-0397. I appreciate uh, so many of you come and work and, and do and share. Uh, uh, Eddie and Carrie do the they come in here and clean, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, uh, Robert's out there yesterday and mowing and uh, trying to mow around the church here. And uh, there's other things that you do that we don't see. Uh, the Jones are there, and Brian, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your work and uh, getting us on the internet and uh, reaching out in ways. That message went out to over 130 people last weekend. Uh, people that, that all over the United States. We've got people in Washington State, in Utah, in Wyoming, uh, and people in South Carolina, in uh, New York uh, State, uh, uh, as well as uh, in Texas and uh, Mississippi. Trying to think of uh, there's other places that it goes out, but I can't think of in in Tennessee. So uh, we want people to hear the gospel, and well, two things we're going to brag on throughout the ministry here, as God allows us, is number one, brag on the Lord Jesus Christ, and number two, on His Word. Without His Word, we'd have no foundation, and so. Uh, those things that we will deal with. Now, there's so many issues that people do not consider, uh, even think about. Uh, we're going to have a business meeting next week, right? So, it, I, it, somebody said, well, there's nothing in the Bible about business meetings. So, we have to run. We're going to deal with that next Sunday, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there's things in the Bible about business meetings. Uh, some years ago, I had a... Uh, a, a, a friend that was uh, worked with Jewish people and, and he, he had a Jewish ministries and uh, he, he always closes his uh, messages and his ministry and uh, he had uh, numerous Jewish people that would come to those meetings that they loved him uh, he lived up at uh, Lookout Mountain in Tennessee brother Abed uh, uh, Moore and uh, so, uh, but he would always close his thing saying this, and it comes from uh, Psalm 33, 12. Uh, it says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. And he said, the second thing is, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And there again, that, that scripture, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we need to pray for the peace of America. Now, I want to do something a little bit different today after sharing those scriptures. And uh, then in uh, uh, John chapter 8 and verse 36, uh, the Word talks about something here that uh, through the Word of God, through the love of the Lord, there's something that He offers to us. And if you look at John 8, 36... It says this, uh, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now the Jews said, we've never been in slavery. Now they were, they were under bondage under Roman rule. Good grief, what do you say? So, uh, America has not done away with slavery. They passed a proclamation saying it had. But men are in slavery in America today. And we will look at what that slavery is. And I'd like to tell a little bit of a story. I was born at the beginning of World War II. And uh, I got saved about the end of World War II. I had a brother that served. And uh, we went over to England, went through France, went into Germany <coughs> in the Second World War. So, uh, we know a little bit of those struggles there. 
America has been known as the greatest nation. And its greatness has not been the financial accomplishments that it's, it's done. America has been great because it has followed the Lord to a good extent. And uh, many people have had the desire to see the gospel of Jesus Christ go around the world. When I got saved as uh, just a boy and started going to a church in Amarillo, Texas, we were strongly, strongly missionary. Now, what did that mean? We supported various missionaries going to all around the world. I think at one time, our church supported like 33 missionaries, gave them a, a, a sum every month. So they went to Mexico, they went to Africa, the men, uh, several of them went to Africa. I grew up with a generation that approximately 20 out of our youth group went into the ministry. Some of us are pastors, some evangelists, some edu uh, Christian educators, many as missionaries around the world. Uh, so we've supported missionaries through those years. I belonged to a church in Greenville, South Carolina, and our church, and it was a large church, but our church gave to over a hundred missionary endeavors around the world. So I believe that we're doing God's work when we get God's word out. One of the tests I would say for any mission operation is, what is it doing for the name of Jesus Christ? And what is it reaching out? But I, I grew up in a time, and I can think back, when all of our parades during that Second World War, as a little boy, my dad would take me downtown, put me up on his shoulders, and we'd watch the parades. The parades at that time were mostly military. It, as some of you may remember that. I mean, we had the Army March Group, they had the, uh, the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy. They all marched down Polk Street, which is the main street of Amarillo, Texas. And in those days, and Dad would have me up there, hold me up so I could see. I was so proud of America. I'm, I'm broken hearted to see what's happened today. I would like to share with you some things I've watched uh, several times. I had the joy of knowing Paul Harvey. Anybody remember Paul Harvey? Yeah. Had lunch with him one time in Dumas, Texas. And uh, I was a large into Christian schools and Christian education. I had to Joy was sitting by him at the luncheon. He was asking me questions about the Christian education movement, and I shared that with him, and he shared that later on one of his broadcasts. <clears throat> so, uh, I've appreciated Now, he's been accused of being a turncoat to Russianism and, and all of that, and, and he uh, first supported uh, the Vietnam War, and then later he said, I apologize to the president, said, that's not right. Well, the Vietnam was one of the most terrible things that, have, and, and it lost its military status and became a political football. Now, you may not agree with me; these are my opinions, so uh, don't don't hold it as gospel. But uh, uh, it got to the point where you have men sitting in, in uh, Congress, and some of them very liberal, that uh, kept that thing going back and forth, and it became a political thing. Some drives. People tried to politicize the things in the, in the uh, Middle East there as being nothing but a uh, thing for oil and, and money. And sad to say, a lot of business people supported ventures because it brought us out of depressions and recessions. Because if you're in, if fighting a war and you have to put money out, you got to hire people and put all of that. So that was many of the things that happened. But Paul Harvey, and I heard him give these, one of them is on our founding fathers. I would recommend that you look it up on YouTube and listen to it. Uh, he names uh, most of those 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. And they dedicated their lives, their honor, uh, their, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And that's kind of the last line of the, of the Declaration. They kept it secret because it the... Uh, King of England had already said anybody that opposed and rebelled were treated as traitors and they would be hanged. And so uh, they realized what this was. They weren't a bunch of rebel rousers. They weren't a bunch of poor fellows that didn't have anything else to do than cause a riot. But they stood. These were men that were mostly men of wealth. They were men of position. 
There were men who were lawyers. There were men who were educators. There were men who were preachers. They believed in the idea of freedom and uh, that no country ought to control you. Uh, England at that time was controlling America. All of its production from uh, everything they made, they had to either send to England or pay taxes to England to even produce it and get it out. And uh, they, uh, you know, they were tea drinking. People come over here. They had dearly. Uh, I think one of the football players that took a stand for for the flag of the United States, and I was proud that he did, but the next day he apologized. I know what happened. Probably the NFL said, look, you can't do this and work for us. Or either that or the blacks that were his co-players in that football group uh, probably said, if you expect us to protect you on the field, you better apologize for that. Now, when you have pressure like that, you've got to realize there are times in your life you must make a stand for right and not back down. And not back down. Uh, there's been times that I've had to make stands and I didn't like it, didn't want to do it, but it had to be done. Uh, one time I, I came out on that deal. But the sad thing is the group, when I exposed what was going on, uh, they uh, they procrastinated, and in that time, people started politicking, and they lost. It was a university. They lost several professors. They lost over 200 students, my peers, because they did nothing when a person was doing wrong, and his influence kept being spread throughout that. Now we had 4,000 people. Say, what's a couple of hundred people? There's people that should not have been hurt, but they were hurt because somebody did nothing. So, uh, there, was, there was another time <clears throat> I became an accountant for a company. And when I got in there, it's amazing what you find on the books. And uh, one of my predecessors was, uh, I mean, he was stealing big times, thousands of dollars from the company. And uh, so I, when I realized what was going on, I said, look, I want an independent audit. I don't want us to do this in-house. I want an independent audit so that there's no question. It's not politics. It, there's no question about the finances of this organization and see how much this person has stolen from this corporation prior to me getting in there. And there were people at that, that board meeting, and there were 12 men on that board uh, some of them said, yeah, we, <clears throat> that would be good. And I said, well, we can't afford it. I said, you can't afford not to do it. I said, you must, you must. Be. Well, I know he's wrong, but we're, he's our friend. He's our neighbor. He's one we know. Folks, when you have to stand with friends, neighbors, when I went into the ministry, my family thought I was crazy because my brother's church said, if you go to our seminary and his uh, pastor talked to me, and uh, you get your degree from our seminary, we will guarantee you a church with really adequate finance, and if you're loyal to our denomination for five years, then your whole college note, that whole seminary note for those years you go, will be canceled. You'll owe nothing. Just be loyal to us for five years. And I told him, no, I don't want to be in bondage that way. Uh, their church did not believe in salvation by grace. It believed in salvation by works. You do the best you can. You preach the social gospel. You, you help the, the widows and the hungry. And you, you send aid to everywhere in the world. And uh, that's the way God will accept you. No, that's not the way God accepts you. It's good that people do those things. I'm not against uh, helping people. But if that's your plan of salvation, you don't have a salvation. So, uh, what, is the, what are the chains that we have? Well, there's several types of chains people have today. We have physical chains. Chains. Uh, sex, drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, things that destroy the body. Uh, I, I preached in the early years in tobacco country. And somebody said, are you, you against tobacco? I said, I don't, I am against it. That doesn't keep somebody from going to heaven, so don't get the idea I'm telling you you have to be a non-smoker to get to heaven. I'm not saying that. But 
Somebody said, well, you're against it because of your religion. I said, no. I've got two brothers. One of them died, and the doctor said when he died, he had two things against him. He had uh, cirrhosis of the liver, and the doctor said, your liver's like a piece of granite, and your lungs are just about as bad. He said, I don't know which will get you first. Uh, my other brother, his, uh, uh, his brother, my brother, uh, he got to the point where he needed heart surgery. And I come into his house one day and he has this picture up on the wall. I said, you are living. What in the world is that picture? Uh, picture. Uh, I, I, he said, that's my lungs. I said, what do you do? Let the grandkids get a hold of he, uh, There was about a one inch black at the very bottom of his young lungs. He said, no, that's tar that's built up in my lungs. And all those years of smoking. He started smoking as a teenager. And all those years of smoking, he said, that's the tar that's built up in my lungs. And when he had needed heart surgery, the doctor said, no, send me home. He said, you, uh, you, you, you can't, we can't do it. He said, you couldn't get enough oxygen, even with us pumping oxygen, you can't get enough oxygen in your blood to sustain you through surgery. You'll die on the operating table. So they wouldn't do surgery on him. Now, uh, I have friends and family. Uh, I've seen it in my own family. So I know the cost it's, it's made. <clears throat> there are people that's uh, tied up with emotional change. Well, I know I ought to do this, but uh, what would my friends say? Uh, one time I was dealing with a family and, and uh, I went over to talk to her and their, their daughter had gotten pregnant out of marriage and, and uh, she asked me to go talk to her parents. She said, my mother's, my mother's, you can't even reason with her. Can't talk to her. And uh, she was throwing her out of her home and everything. And so I did. They were a wealthy family and went over there to talk to them. And that whole hour or so that we tried to talk, we, there was no talking. She ran, and, and the dad stood over there and said nothing the whole time. But she ran, what will my friends think that my daughter's pregnant out of wedlock? What will my neighbors think? What will our society group think? And, and she ran it for that for over an hour. And uh, the girl said, See, I can't even talk to her. You can't talk to her. She won't listen. I thought, Mama, this is a daughter that's scared. She's hurt. She has done wrong, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't need a mama to care. And she needs someone to love her in spite of her. Now, I'm a weird character. I don't care what your life's like. I'm going to love you and pray for you, even if you're wrong. Hmm? Uh, somebody told me one time, first church I pastored, preacher, as long as you do what we think, we think is right, we're behind you. I said, I don't need people behind me when I'm right. When I fail, when I fall flat on my face, I need somebody to lift me up, not stomp me down in the mud. People need a friend. We had one of the members of that church got away from God. He was a Sunday school teacher. Got away from God, got into alcohol, got into a, 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 had an affair with a co-worker. He owned a business. Had this a woman that worked for him. Uh, he got away, even finally uh, divorced his wife with this lady. And his health went down the two. And uh, later, I'd always go by. Uh, I'd moved into another part of the country, but I'd always go by and visit with him. He said, why do you keep coming by when, when you know what kind of lifestyle I'm in? Because I said, I want to see the day when you come back to God and you get right and you get God's forgiveness and you get peace. Well, I was going through that part of the country and I called him up and he said, I, I need to talk to you real bad. He said, why don't you come over and have uh, dinner with Linda and I? Linda was his wife that he had divorced. I said, oh, uh, now, you're, you're talking about Linda that I know? He said, yeah. He, I said, I thought you divorced her. He said, I did, but we got remarried. <laughs> but he said, I, I, I want you to come and spend a couple of days with me. I need to talk. And he said, I don't know why you didn't give up on me, but I'm going to tell you right now, you didn't. And I got my life straightened out. I'm back in church. I'm back walking with God. But he, he, I said, well, the same thing in that church. I said, I figured you need a friend when nobody else would be a friend. And folks, if we can't be a friend to them when they fail, what are we going to be a friend to them? Hmm? So, uh, emotional change. The, the people eat up with political change today. 
Now, my, my folks are Southerners, and uh, they were always Southern Democrats. They'd never vote for anybody but a Democrat. Now, I, you could run anything for president as a Democrat, and they'd vote for it. Uh, my dad was a renegade. He would vote. He said, I'm voting for the person, not the political party. If I believe this person's right, I'm going to vote for them, even if they're a Republican. And, and his family's like, ah, how can you do that? We're Democrats. No, we need to be people of right. And uh, I don't agree with what either party's doing a lot of it today. But uh, I, 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 you've got to have a, a measure things on principle. Measure things on what it stands for. Uh, I'm going to say something that hurts your feelings. I'm sorry, but I won't apologize for it. Uh, I don't see how anybody could vote for a Democrat today that's a Christian that's supporting all of the socialism that's going on. Now, if you don't understand that. By the way, you know in Mississippi just a few years ago, when I was still living back there, they decided that none of the school districts was going to teach cursive writing. What's cursive writing? You know, the, uh, the handwriting. They quit teaching it in the school. Why did they quit teaching it? Oh, it's too hard. It makes, you know, it's hard on kids. Let, it, let them print. Uh, what's the importance of cursive writing? Is there any importance? Is it anybody, does it mean anything if, we, if our children write in cursive writing? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Why should we? The Declaration of Independence. Right. All of our historical documents were in cursive writing. If the people cannot do it, you have just what's happening today where you have groups out here that are trying to erase history. Now, they started out with blacks trying to erase all of the, uh, the Civil War people. Just get rid of all of that. But now, they, they, uh, they're desecrating Christopher Columbus, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln even. And... Why are they doing that? Teddy Roosevelt. They are desecrating. They're tearing them down. They're, they're trying to erase history and rewrite history. When my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters came to live with me, she lived with me about five years, and I had been an educator, and I had all these books in the bookshelf, and, and I worked for a Christian publishing company that published textbooks for Christian schools. And so I had uh, copies of those, and I had history books and English books and, uh, and science books. And she'd say, Papa, may I read one of these? Well, sure. I mean, it's better than just sitting on the shelf doing it collecting dust. And she read a history book. And, and she got through the, the 10th and 11th grade of high school. And she said, before she came to live with me, and she said, they don't teach any of this. Is this true? I said, yes, son, that's, uh, that's American history. That's what it says on it. It's American history. And uh, what we went through and fighting with the British and, and all of that and even the, 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 the tremendous losses in the Civil War, I said, all of that's fact. And so she said, wow, uh, they, don't, they haven't taught any of this in my schooling. I've had others say the same. And so she got to reading that and then she got a book on civics, American government. And she said, is this the way that our government was founded? I said, yes. That's all about the constitutionality of our foundation. And, uh, and she read that book. And she'd ask questions about it. And she said, I never even heard of this. Uh, somebody came to me when I taught on the birth of the church and said, we've never heard how the church came about. Uh, one of the reasons we're talking about the book of Acts. So there's political change. There's financial change. I have a family member that uh, when uh, Cuba was uh, uh, supposed to be closed to any traffic, there was a group of businessmen, and he was in that group. They went to Cuba so they could make business arrangements to do business with Cuba even when it was, when it was blocked by the U.S. Uh, but, well, look, you know, we just re we make more money this way. Uh, folks, if money's your only driving force, you're in trouble. Yeah, we've got to have money to live. Uh, I, for instance, the church, uh, Brother Jerry mentioned, you know, uh, giving the offerings. We, we, don't, we don't have a designated uh, offering. Uh, 
One lady I knew, her particular church, she'd been in the hospital and she'd been down in the bed and hadn't been in church in six months. And some of the elders came by and said, now you haven't been paying your pledge. Now in their church they pledge so much a year. And she said, I've been in the hospital. Not one pastor, not one elder, not one deacon has come by to see me in the six months that I've been bed fast. And you're worried about my money. And said, uh, I haven't got a bang for my book. I haven't got a dime out of it. So she said, no, I'll not do it. Well, we'll take you to court. You, you pledged that. I said, folks, that's not right. So, you, you, uh, listen, you uh, listen, if you don't give, God will God talk to you about it. <laughs> I believe we ought to give. We ought to support uh, the ministry and the mission of the local church. And then there's spiritual change. Uh, some people are tied to denominations. I was preaching in, in, back in my hometown after being away many years, and I contacted my sister. And I said, well, sis, why don't you come out and hear me preach? She said, well, I'd like to. Let me check with my pastor and see what he says. Actually, it was her priest. And uh, she, she called me back and said, I can't come. I said, why can't you come? My priest said, absolutely not. Uh, he doesn't believe like we do. And you can't go and listen to him preach. And I thought, now, you, I said, you need to get in the Bible. Well, we, we don't, they don't encourage us to read the Bible. That's for men that are studied and prepared. And so uh, they'll give us what we need to know out of the Bible. Folks, if the, if, if the only Bible you get is what I give here on Sunday, you're in trouble. You don't know enough. That'd be like eating one time a week. Now, uh, you can tell I like to eat. Uh, I, but I sure as the world don't want to eat just one day a week. Now, my wife might only eat one day a week. But uh, we, we, I eat regularly. Uh, I got up this morning. I ate, <laughs> and uh, I'll eat later today. Uh, but the Bible is your spiritual food. God feeds you on. It's not a, a book of do's and don'ts. It's a book on how to live and how to have a relationship with God. But people are under spiritual chains. I got run off from a group because I was preaching the Bible, and they said, well, that's not what our denomination believes. I said, it's the Bible. I don't care what the Bible says. That's not, you've got to conform to our denomination. Now, uh, there, there, I had to take a stand. They put me out. They run me off. And uh, I said, look, it's the Bible. No, it's, it's not what we believe. Folks, there are people today that's under spiritual chains and the chains of darkness. They believe what their denomination. I've had people in my own church say, Oh, I, all the Bible I need, I get on Sunday. Folks, you're not going to get enough on Sunday to feed you a whole week long. Take my word for it. All right, how do we break those chains? Well, years ago, I grew up under some great preachers in America. I grew up under men that were men of character, men like uh, Paul Harvey. And. Uh, uh, Henry Morris, who was a great scientist, and he did not believe in evolution. He believed in creation, that God created man in His own image. And uh, But uh, the old preachers used to say, you've got to have character over popularity. Popularity is trying to form your views to fit the people around you, or the people you have to do with. Character is what's right in the line of the Word of God. Your character has got to be based on truth. Amen. What that verse scripture says, the truth shall make you free and you shall be free indeed. Uh, you've got to study over ignorance. There was a church when I was helping establish Christian schools and they had called me to come and speak at their church. They wanted to start a Christian school up in North Mississippi. So I, I drove up there and uh, uh, I uh, spoke and uh, told that God didn't put a premium and a value on ignorance. I said, you ought to study. You ought to know something. Uh, I mean, I, when I graduated from uh, one of the colleges, one of the fellows I graduated with said, but I tell you, this is the last time I'm going to open a book. I am sick and tired of studying and going to school it. He was going into computer science. <laughs> I said, Bill, you might as well quit right now. 
Because that's a field you don't have to study the rest of your life. I said, you go into law. You, my nephew was an attorney for many years till he retired. You're going to have to study the rest of your life as a lawyer. Go to school. And uh, if you're a doctor, I hope you learn and keep up with that. Uh, I mean, good grief. Now that, if you think, well, how do I learn? I worked under a professor in the university who had, who had what they call tenure. They couldn't fire him. But he taught there. I was teaching what they call digital electronics. That's these little old gadgets, these little old tiny things you can barely see that's inside your phones, it's in your microwave, it's in everything. Those little old things, legs aren't there, and, 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 and they, and, and they control everything that device does. And uh, so uh, your phone has a little thing called a SIM card in it. You may have seen it, may not. It's a little old tiny thing. That controls how that phone works and reacts. But uh, uh, I was teaching digital electronics there. He had he was over that department, and he had a wooden device there that he could turn the knobs on, and it would do things. Looked like uh, one of them old uh, things years ago they called Babbage uh, calculator. But uh, it, it, he turned wheels there, and it would do things like that. And uh, somebody said, oh my, Dr. So-and-so has taught here 20 years. Uh, I said, no. Dr. So-and-so and I worked for it. I said, he's taught here one time. He has never changed his syllabus. He's never changed his teaching to update anything new in 20 years. He used the same syllabus he used to. I said, all he has done is taught that one year 20 times. <laughs> he, he, listen, I want my doctor to stay up to date, don't they? My dad died of cancer, that today they're successful in treating that kind of cancer. So, how do we break? The, you, you've got to knelt back down. Stand for the truth and don't back down. Do we have slavery today? Yes, we do. We have people that are enslaved to political ideologies. We have Christians that are enslaved to religious systems. And we have Christians who are sold out to pleasure rather than God. We've got to have a people today, folks, that liberty is more important than security. I ask Rita to please uh, play uh, the national anthem. Uh, that's another one you might look up on YouTube. The true story of the national anthem. That will not only teach you to appreciate the song, but what it was about. And uh, we don't have time to get into that. But there's a great price that people pay for their life. The, the flag never touched the ground. You know how it was held up? I mean the British bomb, a shot bombed and everything else for hours all through one night. But that flag still stood. You know why it stood? They pushed the dead bodies of people that were slaughtered by the ammunition being fired into that Fort Henry. They pushed their bodies up there to keep that flag. It was cocked off at a cockeyed angle. But they pushed their bodies up there to make sure that flag stood and they ended up giving their own lives. Listen, folks. Uh, I, I have a real problem. I hope I never see somebody... Uh, urinating on the on the flag, by, uh, burning the flag, I wouldn't guarantee you probably have to come see me or let know that I've gone to prison. Mm -hmm. uh, we need, uh, we've got a lot of old men that have been in the uh, war and, and, and stood for what's right and, and seen their, uh, their buddies' caskets come back. We had a young man that was killed in, I'm going to say Afghanistan, I believe it was Afghanistan, but anyway, he came back. He was a young Marine. And uh, you're talking about these marches and things. When you came into Petal, Mississippi from Laurel, which is about 27 miles, uh, 25 miles to the north of, of Petal, when his, uh, when his casket came in, brought in by a military Marine group, they, and they was announced when he'd come in, they even had to let the schools out and young boys and girls lined that highway on both sides and they stood there with their hands over their hearts as that, that uh, her 
came through our town to bring one of our own back home to bury. They that they didn't start a riot. They didn't start a fight. They didn't. But he stood there with honor. I was there. I watched those boys and girls standing there, just as silent and quiet as could be. And this has only been less than ten years ago, folks. Amen. It's not. It's not ages ago. This is less than ten years ago when this young man came back, and and, and he was dead. And, and then uh, one of the young men that I was going to tell about that came, he came home in a flag draped coffin. And uh, one of the young one of the young men that came home with him had been one of his uh, buddies there in the service, and he requested that they let him come back with the body and meet the parents and extend the condolences. And uh, he said, "I knew when he fell. I knew when he fell." He said he had been my friend. And he said, I requested that I come back. And they let him come back and escort that body to his home and meet with his mom and dad. Folks, freedom is costly. Freedom is not free. Freedom, remember that. Freedom is not free. It's costly. If you and I extend, expect to be true, if we expect to remain free, we must stand for what's right. Let's bow our head in prayer, please. Lord, we're thankful for your truth. We're thankful for this country that we've had the privilege of meeting in, in, in church like this, in assembly, that many nations do not even allow Christianity in today. Father, thank you that we have this freedom to fellowship, this freedom to study, this freedom to pray. Thank you for this people. Now let me ask you if there's someone here today that's not saved, you're not sure. You'd say, Preacher, please remember me in prayer. I doubt my salvation. I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven if I were to die today. I'm not going to embarrass you, not ask you to come up, but just raise, raise your hand and put it back down. Let me acknowledge it. Okay, Heavenly Father, you know the hearts and lives. Help us to go forth and stand true to you and not give up. Help us to be men and women of character, believing you, believing your word, and standing true. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Amen.